So, as we begin this morning, we continue um, in our journey series. And uh, for those of you that don't realize, we're still uh, reeling from a little bit of our technological stuff. Uh, some of what we ordered to replace some of those things was delivered somewhere. Somebody else has it. Um, so they said, hey, we delivered it Friday morning. Yeah, while it was sitting in the office, didn't come here. Um, so we're, uh, we're still working through some of the technological, technological things. But uh, ready? <laughs> now, see, you can see everything that it does now. We appreciate I didn't realize more. I didn't realize that until uh, Tuesday when I when I got the camera and, and started going through it because my back was turned. I didn't know all of what was going on back there, and I had forgotten uh, forgotten all of those things. Our journey, remember, is not a journey that's just us, just one of us, just me, or just you, for that matter. This is a journey that we take corporately in the body of Christ. Now, it includes us individually, but it's about God and his church, the body of Christ, journeying together, led by the Spirit, empowered to do great things. Not for our glory, not for our honor, not so that people will notice us, but so that they see him. And so this morning... There's a question that I want us to, um, to kind of keep in mind as we move forward here. Not this question, sorry. I, did I go one too far? I may have. Anyway, the question is, are you walking in the way, the way of Christ, or are you standing in the way? That's our question. It'll come up here. I know that there's a couple screens there. So we start this morning in Acts chapter 11. We're not going through every single chapter. Um, we're piling some of these together because they, uh, they follow a certain theme. But the book of Acts is a reminder of the work of God through his people in the first years following Jesus' resurrection and ascension. As Jesus went around speaking truth and healing, people were seeing God's plan and God's purpose. So when he went back to heaven, when he was ascended back to heaven, who was left to share the message, the truth, the life that Jesus had begun? That's his people, his followers, the church empowered by the Holy Spirit's presence to do great things, to do amazing things. So we start in Acts chapter 11 this morning. Acts chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. Let's stand together. We'll uh, stand in honor, <clears throat> in honor of the word of the Lord and all that he has done and wants to do. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, Jewish believers, contended or argued with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. But Peter rehearsed the matter, or told the matter over and over, from the beginning, and expounded or explained it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa. Pray. And in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descend, this sheet, as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me, e upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and the wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or defiled or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common or unclean. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. 
And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me, and the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in the house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I, that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd speak your words into our hearts. Help us to bring honor and glory to you. Show us who you are in amazing ways today. We ask it in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, Furman, will you close the hallway door back there? The one that goes down to the hallway for me? <laughs> so the kids can turn their stuff on as loud as they need to turn it on. With Queen Esther. Thank you. Yes, they've got Esther teaching the lesson on Queen Esther this morning, so that should be lots of fun. Peter is defending his ministry to the Gentiles. Now, we talked about this episode last time, and we talked about when God speaks to us and how we respond. Well... Here's the aftermath. Here's the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey, some of you remember, would have said, the rest of the story. <coughs> Peter goes back, victory in his pocket. All of these former heathens came and heard the word of the Lord. The Lord saved them. They were saved amazingly and powerfully. The whole house, all of his relatives and friends that he gathered. And so he comes back home and his friends, the people that are part of the church, people that followed Jesus, that walked with Jesus, said, What did you do? They're not Jews. Now, they... Jews of this day and age believed that you could become a Jew by being circumcised, but the Bible's very clear. This wasn't the case. These were Gentiles. And as far as the people of God who considered themselves the people of God, whether they followed after God wholly or not, they knew that racially they were Jews, which meant they were the people of God. Everybody else was outside. Peter had gone in to eat with them, to tell them about the gospel. And so Peter begins to expound to them what happened. Just simply, what took place. And he reminds them, while he was just getting started, while he was just getting into his sermon, the Holy Spirit began to fall. And the hearers in their hearts believed on Jesus Christ. They experienced what uh, Ralph Earl calls evangelical conversion. Then because their hearts were fully open for all of God's will, these listeners who had walked devoutly in the light of Judaism but weren't Jews, had now accepted Christ, were suddenly filled with the Holy Spirit. So, God is saying, this is what I want to do. So here's our question. Are you walking in the way, capital W on purpose, or are you standing in the way? Oh, help us. Come on. Now, don't let the cleverness of the word somehow pass over you or whatever. But the reality is this is exactly the question for all of us in this day and age. We're either following Christ, we're walking in the way that God is leading us through the Holy Spirit, 
or we're standing in the way of what he wants to do. Now, how can we stand in the way of what God wants to do? Well, the reality is God is going to do his thing. You can try to stand in the way and you can mess up your life. But God's ultimate plan, he'll work out. However, it is possible for us to stand in the way by not being obedient to what God calls us to do. Now, these are believers that ask Peter these questions. And we see from verse 18 that once he had told them the whole story, they said, well, the question that you ask is perfectly reasonable. If this is what God is doing, how am I to stand in to do anything differently? And they said, well, yeah, guess that's true. Now, this contention would continue to come up a few other times in the early church because Jesus was a Jew. The disciples were Jews. The healings were for Jews. The teachings were for Jews. They were the people of God. But God had already said in the Old Testament, some of which Peter had even quoted on the day of Pentecost, that this is what God was talking about when he was talking about this message going out farther than just those of us who are racially Jews. So they said, I guess if it's God's thing, if that's what he wants to do, which is becoming obvious, then we'll follow. We won't stand in the way. For you and I, I think the questions, or the, the questions that are raised by this call us to ask ourselves, are we part of the solution or part of the problem? Are we part of the plan to reach people for Christ? Are we part of what God is doing? Or are we standing in the way, somehow either wanting our own way, or perhaps just being lazy? Not that we're opposed to God, we're just not on His team. Come on. We dressed out, but we're still standing and sitting in the bleachers. We're not in the dugout. I've got my clothes on, I've got my uniform on, yeah, but you got your tennis shoes on. Sitting up there with the crowd, just watching what's going on. God is expecting His people to be involved in what He's doing. That's right. Yes. That's right. Come on. Hello? <laughs> You better say Promised. that again. You better say that again. <laughs> God is expecting his people to get involved in what he's doing. Amen. Sorry. Yes, come on. On purpose. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's his plan. Who's going to do it? Only those who follow Christ. Only those who know the power of the Holy Spirit will go and tell. You may not have a gift of evangelism, and that's perfectly fine. But that doesn't mean that he lets you off the hook for telling people about Jesus. Come on. He's given you your way, your that's right. gifting, that's your right. talent Come to on. let people know who Jesus is. Oh, but I don't know all of the Bible. I haven't memorized it. I haven't either. He says he would fill our lips He'd fill our mouth by His Holy Spirit with what we need to say. What He wants from us is our obedience, our willingness to say, Lord, I will be a part of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And Peter was telling the other disciples, the other believers, that's all I was doing. I was doing what God said to do. And he reminded them that he had a bit of a problem when, when he saw the animals and there were unclean animals and the voice had said, Peter, eat. And he said, oh, not me. I'm a good Jew. I haven't done that. But he realized when the vision was done, they were shouting at the door. 
And they said, hey, we're supposed to be here looking for Peter. We're supposed to take him to, take him to our boss. Who's had a vision that he's going to tell him everything that he needs to know to be saved. And so Peter's response, the response of a good Jew was, no, I'm not going to eat that. And he still didn't know exactly what God was doing. But then he gets to the house and realizes he's traveled with and spent the night with the overnight, you know, on the road and stuff like that. Camping under the stars, all that fun stuff. He spent all of that time with heathens. These are people that aren't the people of God according to their race. But he finds that what God is doing, he's already prepared the way. So Peter gets there, begins to speak, and suddenly the Holy Spirit puts the exclamation point on it and says, this is exactly what I wanted to do. And Peter, the Jew, is like, guess God's got a plan that's bigger than my plan. That's bigger than what I came up with or what my ancestors came up with. It's bigger than all of that. So we ask the question, are you walking in the way, the way of Jesus? That was the original name for those who followed Jesus Christ. They were in the way. Or are we standing in the way of what he wants to do? Going back to the circumstance, going back to what Peter is talking about. Peter had a receptive audience, Ralph Earl says, ready and willing to walk in the light. And he makes the, com the further comment, that's the secret of the results that took place. When all the people were filled with the Spirit, when the Spirit fell on all of those who were not Jews, but when they heard that what Peter was talking about when he was telling them about Jesus, that he had died for our sins, and that he had taken all of that on himself, and they too could be saved, they were receptive, willing to walk in the light that was shed on their path, and that is the secret to the results that took place. What would the church around the world be like? <coughs> every time we gathered together we gathered together with a heart that truly and honestly said Lord I want you to do everything in me today that you want to do but we live in the 21st century we're in America we're in the Bible Belt and according to some of the recent research I've seen we Greenville Spartanburg Anderson up to Asheville this area is number six in the country of Christians. Number six out of like 150 different areas of the country. But are we listening hmm. to God? We, we call ourselves Christians, and sometimes we come to church saying, whew, I really need to get back in church. I really need to be there. I really need to be there. Why? Well, I really need to be there. Why? Well, I'm going because I haven't been for a while. Well, why? Because there are people there that haven't seen me. Why do you need to go? Is it because God Almighty wants to do something in you, and you're ready to say, Lord, whatever it is you want to do, I am willing. Because if that's the reason that we come to church, God will do amazing things. He'll do them to us. He'll do them through us. But if we're not there, then perhaps, perhaps instead, we get exactly what we were expecting. Took an hour, hour and a half, blah, 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 whatever. Sang some songs. I remember those days. I grew up in the Church of the Nazarene. We sang three songs, had an offertory. 
After the offered word, somebody got up and sang. The Pastor spoke. Yeah, it was the special. <laughs> Sorry. Pastor spoke. Had an altar call every time. Five people who always came, always came. And then we said, you're dismissed. Now, I know that's oversimplified, and I'm not saying that the Spirit never fell, but when we get into habits and don't expect Him to do something in us, in the me, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good to say, well, you know, if such and such had been there, they needed to hear what was said this morning. They needed to be a part of that. How about you? But there's a reason. God calls us into a deeper relationship with Him, a relationship of obedience. I'm the one. Thompson in Deacon Bible Commentary says, The reader of Acts will be caught up in the struggle to recognize what God is doing and challenged to partner with God's saving purposes. As you and I read the book of Acts, as we see the Holy Spirit moving in the church and doing the work that God has planned, we will be caught up by seeing all that God does and then challenged to say, Lord, what do you want to do? What do you need me to be a part of? We've said before, and it's true, and it hit me like a ton of bricks the first time I heard it. God doesn't need you. But he wants you to participate yes. with what he's doing. Mom. He's the Almighty. Think of it. Dad, you do construction. That's your job. That's your profession. You know exactly what to do. Exactly what is your five-year-old son going to be able to do to help you build what needs to be built? You don't need him. But as you bring him in and allow him to be a part of it and to participate, he grows. Yes. God, who is infinitely, vastly beyond us, beyond that father, that earthly father and a son, God doesn't need our skill set. We don't bring anything to the table that God is waiting and saying, oh, that's what I've needed. That's what I was missing all along. We don't bring that to the table. But like the most loving father. He says, I want you to participate. I want you to be a part of what I'm doing. Yes. How many of you moms have ever received those dandelions? Flowers from the weeds. Yeah. And love them. Yes. Sometimes that's what we bring to God. But he loves it when we bring Him who we are, what we are, what we have to offer. When we bring that to Him and say, Lord, use it however you want to use it, we're, we grow in the process. We're made more. We don't make God more because we participate. But he makes us more. Yes. Because he wants to do amazing things. One commentator writes, such a dramatic sense of God's initiative is essential when God's purposes move outside traditional boundaries and assumptions. Mm -hmm. Here's how I look at that. If you believe that what God is doing, you can plan and anticipate and work out in your tiny mind, it's probably not God's. But if what you're witnessing 
and what you're expecting is God to do abundantly above all that you ask or think or can even imagine, if that's what you're expecting, if that's what you're seeing in what God is doing, then when He says, I want you to do this that's outside of what others might think or say, that's outside of the predicted outcome, you're a lot more ready to say, okay, Lord. If your barometer, if your measure for the movement of God is that He is actively, intimately involved in moving us, in leading us, then when He leads outside of your expected boundaries, you're much more willing to say, okay, it's your, it's your job, it's your business. If that's what you're calling me to, then that's where I go. He further asks the question, do we fail to recognize God at work because our generalizations and labels define, sometimes too specifically, who he is or is not Christian, Orthodox, Spirit-filled, Evangelical, etc., or whatever else ends up blocking divine activity from our view? In other words, do we sometimes put our agenda in front of God's face and say, okay, now these are the people that you can reach, and this is the way that you can do it. Instead of saying, Lord, you're the Almighty. Show me what you need me to do. And help me to recognize what you're doing, what you're already doing, what you're how you're moving in this world. How you're moving at the tip of my fingers. We too need prayerful discernment and perspective to recognize God's grace and purposes at work among those we might least expect. We should not limit, much less oppose God by stubbornly holding on to our preconceived ideas. How is God going to work? In ways beyond my full comprehension. Why? Because He's God. I'm not. He's the one who has the plan. He's the one who has the purpose. And He is going to do abundantly above all that we ask or think. And He wants us to participate. To be a part of what He's doing. Now I'm going to throw some some theological studies at you real quickly. Just fancy. Some some of it's just fancy words. John Wesley had a quadrilateral. Quadrilateral of Christian authority. Now there are, there are churches, there are movements that say if it's not in the Bible, it has no authority whatsoever. Which means you don't use your brain. The Bible says it, it says it literally and if, it, if it's not there then it doesn't matter. Well in our day and age, I believe that we could probably say there are a lot of things that the Bible doesn't specifically cover that he wants us to pray about, to seek his face about, that aren't specifically in the letters that are in the Bible. Okay? Wesley believed that as well. And this is his quadrilateral. Scripture is the primary authority. None of these other three can contradict Scripture. If Scripture says it, none of the other three trumps it. Come on. But if Scripture doesn't say it, or it's not as clear as you might like it to be, you can also use reason. Or tradition. What what have Christians down throughout the ages understood that to mean? That we take that into account. And then religious experience. And the reason I I bring this up is because Peter doesn't go to Scripture, to the Old Testament Scripture, to prove what God had done. Now, he he had done that on the day of Pentecost when he quoted from Malachi. He said, this is what God was talking about in um, 
and other passages of Scripture. Joel. This is what God was talking about. But on this instance, when he's defending what God was doing, when he's defending his ministry, he doesn't go back to Scripture and quote Scripture for his Jewish friends and tell them, this is why I did this. He said, if God is going to pour out the Holy Spirit on them, then apparently he's going to share it with the Gentiles. Whether our scripture says that, and as they go throughout the letters and as they, they continue, they realize it's been saying that from the very beginning, though they didn't like that particular part, parts. But he's saying, if the Holy Spirit has come on them just like he did on us on the day of Pentecost, then this must be God's work. And if this is God's work, who am I to stand in the way? It is noteworthy that, believer, that the believers did not turn to Scripture in working through this issue as they often did in Acts. Instead, Peter turned to the recognition of divine activity through the collective experience and discernment of the community of faith. Now those four things, those extra three things, reason, tradition, and religious experience, they're not a measuring stick for an individual to decide this is what I believe and this is how I'm going to, to go. This is all within the context of the body of Christ, the community of believers. As we together begin to recognize and see what God is doing, even if God is doing a new thing, it's not about simply going off on some tangent, it's about the body of Christ recognizing this is God at work. And so in verse 18, when the rest of the disciples said, well, if that's what God is doing, then let's get on board. As the body recognized, it wasn't just about somebody going off on a tangent and saying that something about commandments that may or may not be proven. It's about the body of Christ recognizing the truth of what yes. God is doing. Yes. This divine guidance and activity occurred in the collect in collective rather than individualistic way. What Christ did for mankind, he did for all of mankind. And what how he's moving outside of the boundaries, he does through individuals as they begin to see, but it's for the whole body. And as the body of Christ, as fellow believers, we sharpen one another, we challenge one another to be in God's will and in his purpose. Because we can easily get out into something that seems a whole lot more just emotional hype, Yes. And no depth of relationship right. with Christ. That's easy to get into. We get excited at ball games and things like that. That doesn't matter for eternity. Sorry. It really doesn't. There's another season next time. There's another right. first place. There's another trophy. There's a... Those things don't have eternal value. But we get excited and passionate about them. We should be getting excited and passionate about what God is doing in our midst. Yeah. So the question, are we as a church seeking the prayer-filled discernment of the Spirit to determine what God is up to so that we might know how and where to join Him for His honor? Are we seeking that the Spirit will lead us, that we're asking and we're listening, we're reading His Word, we're fellowshipping with His church, with the body, as we sharpen one another, as we challenge one another, as we encourage one another, are we asking God, show us what you want to do and how I can get involved in it? Yes. So back to our question. Are you walking in the way? with Jesus 
Or are you standing in the way? Come on. Remember, Come on. sometimes standing in the way is just yeah. not participating. That's right. You're dressed out. Turn the bleachers. Yeah. Lord, help us. Oh, Lord. That's a question.